It will come as no surprise to many in the audiences that lexemes seemingly, seemingly literally translated translatable can actually vary greatly in their meaning from one language, one culture, and one life world to another. This workshop addresses one sex such lexeme land. In what follows, I bracket nature in good phenomenological fashion and explore what various people, peoples and the cluster of regions here signified as the Pacific seem to mean by lexemes that have been translated into the English word land. I will use Australian Aboriginal, which is really not my expertise, but I've been intrigued with them for a long time. Highlands Papua New Guinea and Hawaiian materials, creating a context perhaps for what Professor Palmer will have to say about the New Zealand Maori after I speak. <coughs> Australian Aborig Aborigines explain the world through creation stories. The origin of the world is rooted in something called the dreaming or the dream time, the time of ancestral figures who molded the land topographically, which was otherwise featureless, through their travels and escapades, moving all across the land, creating landscape. Um, and this, these movements are recounted in Aboriginal mythology and song. Dreamtime beings are part animal, part human, neither the one nor the other, but both. None of these beings is thought to have died. Their bodies disappeared or metamorphosed into some other topographical form, but their spiritual essence remained. They retain ultimate control of plant, animal, and human fertility. And this is from Bob Tonkinson's book on the Marjujara Aborigines. In the course of moving across the land, the ancestors seeded the land with future animals, plants, and humans. At sites strongly associated with particular dream time beings, Aboriginals performed what had been called in the literature increased rituals to assure future deals of plants, animals, and humans. So-called uh, descent to refought as serial regeneration, as well as so-called nature, are therefore manifestations of the living presence and benevolence of dreamtime beings as they continue to involve themselves in the human realm. What then is land? Not merely material or geological, for the Australian Aboriginal, it has high religious value as a sculpted residue of ancestral times and ancestral lives. The topographical features of the land are, quote, this is from Nancy Munn's book, Walbury Iconography, due to bodily imprints tied to ancestral events, a statement that is not only true of the Walbury, but is also more generally true of Aboriginal culture. In general, land is the ineradicable presence of the ancestors in the present, the interface between ancestors and their descendants. This interface between the living and the not dead, as it were, this interface is self-consciously forged and dramatized in Aboriginal ritual. The mythic narr narratives recounting the events that shape the landscape bring matter notionally into the realm of action and language, liberating these actions from the time and space of their occurrence and according them significance. The Aboriginal landscape is script, wall period iconography. It's kind of written language. The principal message of this script um, is that the land or landscape was gifted to humans and other species as a fertile, renewable resource. That human beings function as stewards of this resource, performing increased rituals, completes the circle of the relationship. Um, in the most sacred of Aboriginal rituals, performance, performers, typically male, decorate their skins with iconography, iconography evocative of the heroic activities of dream time beings, and they narrate these activities in sacred songs. So they decorate their skin with this script, as it were. Um, you can see here some of the um, iconography. Um, it's very obvious. This indicates movement in a direction. Um, this is an icon for kangaroo, um, icon for uh, goanna, icon for emu. You might know if you've been to Canberra that that icon is on the parliament building in Canberra. Um, dingo and so on. Um, and then snake, obvious with the snake. Um, now I'll show you how these might look um, with respect to decoration on uh, performers' bodies. Those taking part in these rituals have their bodies decorated with sacred designs that symbolize the dream time person and typically his escapades. The paintings transform participants into dream time persons. They dance and imitate the behavior of these beings as if they were in the dream time. Um, and then in thus embodying the ancestors, they shift from the, they shift from the quotidian interface of living on, of um, interface of 
living on land filled with emblems and residues of past ancestral life to a momentary fusion with ancestors in sacred time and space. And if I can master this complicated technology. <laughs> um, here you see some more of the um, iconography. These circles can mean a number of things. Here it seems to mean campfire or tree. Uh, and then you might have little U's around the campfire that might indicate that persons are si sitting at a campfire. Um, here you have spears, journey or path. Could also mean snake, that one, kangaroo tracks, email tr emu tracks. Um, and uh, you will have the use of this iconography in sand paintings, also in the decoration on ritual performers' bodies, and on the paraphernalia that's used, used in Aboriginal rituals. It all evokes the ancestor and the journeys of the ancestor, um, his typically escapades. Uh, and then these escapades are reflected in the landscape, which becomes script, something that narrates the journey of the ancestors. Uh, so that is what land is to them. The yield on these rituals is the continuing fertility of the earth, which is attributed to the ancestors and the benevolence of their design for human life, as well as to their descendants who cultivate that fertility through ritual performance and other acts of stewardship. Aboriginal sacred rituals activate the regenerative potential that gene dreamtime beings created as they traveled across the land, seeding the land uh, with what Deborah Bird Rose has called, quote, the outpouring of the life of the country including the people of the country. So what you have is continuing regeneration through the relationship between the living and the ancestral uh, beings. Land or country, as Aborigines refer to it, is, quote, in her words, nourishing terrain. Viewed experientially, which Aborigines themselves so clearly do, land and ritual fall on a continuum of degrees of intimacy, communication, and identification with dreamtime beings. Through both land and ritual, Aboriginals enter into relationship with dreamtime ancestors, whether in the unfolding presence of non-sacred time uh, and ancestor-descendant interface, just by looking at the landscape, um, or, in the day, or by harvesting also the landscape, or in the time beyond time of ritual fusion. What the notion of dream time and its various rituals, re ritual reenactments accomplish is to bring the land inscribed through dream time activity into a post-natural, necessarily homocentric world of narration and language, of purposeful activity or creation, and of interaction on a cosmic scale, a feat the book of Genesis also accomplishes. Now moving on uh, from uh, the Australian continent, if now, if now we travel to Highlands, New Guinea, specifically to Anga and the Southern Highlands provinces, I do my work in the Anga province, as uh, we see as well that land there is not views, viewed as substance pure and simple, a datum of nature, but is fundamentally social and cosmic, the focus of and reason for a relationship between the living and the dead through which the fertility of the earth is maintained. The term sacred geography, um, which was invented by Lawrence Goldman, he will insist on that, and was then adopted by Stephen Frankel, uh, refers to a string of ancestor-related sites that were in the pre-colonial period linked through a sequence of fertility rituals called Dindigamu, or earth magic, in Huli-speaking parts of this area, um, akin to what's called earth straightening uh, rituals among the Duna to the west uh, and northwest. The Huli called these sites earth knots, Dindipongone, uh, they were linked through an underground cane or rattan and associated with an underground python whose body mapped the complex ritual terrain. Ibali speakers whom I study refer to them as yukumbuni, this is mentioned in the article that you apparently read for today, or ground joints, which was sometimes, as in Mount Kare, but not al always associated with a python. So you have a pythonic figure that crosses ethnic um, lands, as it were, and really refers to the unity of the earth as, that, as a unit um, that is cultivated through ritual in ways that I'll now describe. Uh, it, we, <clears throat> sorry. Ritual sacrifices to maintain the fertility of the earth were performed whenever fertility seemed to lag or other events, sickness, war, undermined the health and well-being of those living in these areas. In the Huli system, sacrifices seem to have been made across the entire string of sites in a fixed sequence. 
This may have been true among ritual sites that were mythologically connected in the Ippoli-speaking area as well, although I'm not sure about that. I say ritual sacrifices are not just rituals because the important step taken in them was to feed the ancestral figure, snake or other, securing typically his goodwill so that in reciprocity, the land understood to be aging, its life-giving vitality flagging would once again become regenerative. Uh, I don't know if you've read this literature, but uh, people love to talk about entropy. It's a term I hate. I don't really think it quite gets at the fact that we're talking about a biological process, uh, process uh, of life cycle. I'll focus here briefly not on a ritual that you read about in that uh, paper of mine, but on um, a ritual that was performed at the easternmost such Yukimbuni site, Nippoli speaking territory, uh, at a place called Tipinini. The site is linked in Ippoli myth with northern and also southeastern locations as one Yukimbuni or ground joint among many, the entire complex crossing ethnic and linguistic lines. And here I could say something about the image of the ground joint. Um, it evokes the notion of an organic body. Uh, so you have a collection of ground joints that are articulated uh, that can be mapped out on the ground in a human figure, and that has been done uh, for me. Uh, the story behind the Tippinini site is that the earth became flooded when the man responsible for controlling its level, level of water left the area briefly to attend a ritual elsewhere. When he discovered what had happened, he quickly returned and created four riverbeds to drain off the excess water, after which effort he expired. The spot where he died is a ground joint spot, and it is here that the line responsible for performing the sacrifices killed and sacrificed pigs whenever the land's fertility seemed to wane to ensure the well-being of all species, human and other. I have interpreted this in other dimensions of Ipoli culture in terms of sacrificial principle, uh, which is that the cost of fertility and the renewal of life is death. Death, then, is a condition of life. Whether it is the death of the river-making hero who is honored in this ritual or of the pigs that are sacrificed in it, um, in Duna land you get notions of human sacrifice as well uh, with respect to these rituals, the ground straightening rituals. While time does not permit my making a full case for the existence of this principle, principle suffice it to say that I'm not the only ethnographer working in this area who acknowledges its existence. It is, my, it is, in my understanding, the principle, the cultural logic, a logic implicit not only in uh, ritual sacrifices, but also in the entirety of Ippoli social organization, uh, from so-called descent to marriage, as well as in notions of pollution and related practices associated with all aspects of sexual reproduction. Amounting to the claim that land-based uh, life is mortal, this principle is rescinded with respect to the sky and its denizens, all of whom are immortal. What then is land? This is the second time I'm asking this question here. As among the Australian Aboriginals, its topo topographical features may be attributed to the creative activities of ancestral beings whose escapades are recounted in myth. But more to the point, the notion that the sacrificial principle operates on the ground and not in the sky, where there is no land. Land is in the ground, not in the sky. Renders the ground a sector of a cosmological order, one that hinges on the mortal immortal binary. Again, Gen Genesis comes to mind. As such, the land has its own modus operandi to sacrifice life to gain life. Again, nature infused with meaning is fully incorporated within the cultural realm where it is governed and managed not environmentally but through social relations of exchange. Dead ancestors are gifted as a condition of their reciprocity, which is the renewal of the life of the ground. Indeed, the Tibonini sacrifices were performed where the bones of the deceased ancestor were thought to lie. Now we go to Hawaii. Um, this is going to be entirely um, too short. Uh, but we do have more Polynesian material coming in over here. Uh, this is a Polynesian island, and it is fitting that I close with a few comments on Hawaii as a prelude to the foray into New Zealand materials Professor Palmer has promised to make. One cannot help but notice the importance of land to Hawaiian people. There are the impassioned efforts to recover land wrested from Hawaiians under U.S. colonialism by those associated with the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. There is the very focused and sustained campaign commemorated in the wonderful documentary Kaha Olave Aloha Aina, 
to end the destruction and desecration, desecration of this the smallest island within the Hawaiian archipelago at the uh, hands of the U.S. military, which used the island for training purposes, bombing it repeatedly, and destroying its vegetation and capacity to hold the water needed to sustain life. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that story, but uh, I recommend you familiar, familiarize yourself with it. Uh, the Hawaiians were successful. Bombing stopped as of 1990, and the island has since been reserved for native Hawaiian use only. The island is crucial to the Hawaiian Renaissance, uh, beginning in the mid-1970s, as it is used for the, the revival of Hawaiian traditions, the hula navigation, and also ritual, and ritual is what I will be focusing on here. Um, I'm going to be focusing just briefly uh, on a ritual called Makahiki, which you might know of from reading Marshall Stalin's account of Captain Cook's death. Uh, as online material generated by Hawaiian Renaissance experts has it, quote, we go to Kaha Olave to strengthen our relationship to the land, uh, and Hawaiians do this most dramatically in their revival of the Makahiki on Kaha Olave. Um, and if I could move forward here, these are those, that iconography as art, as it were, by Aboriginal art, you buy this iconography. Here's Kaha Olave, and um, this is, uh, I believe this is Maui, um, Kaha Olave. I believe Kaha Olave is said to, there's, there's supposed to be an umbilical cord connecting it with Maui, which is the maternal island. Then you can see it in the configuration of the archipelago, it's the smallest island there. Um, uh, Kaha Olave and the Makahiki are associated with the god Lono, uh, represented over here, and this is the Akualoa, which is a symbol of Lono deployed in the Makahiki. You know from Marshall Solins' accounts um, that um, this looks very much like a shift, ship mast. It's part of uh, his reasoning that uh, Cook was considered to be Lono uh, when he first arrived. Um, because he looked like his ship looked like the Aku, Aku Aloha. It was a terrific setup, really, <laughs> uh, that he was understood to be Lono, and he arrived in the Makahiki uh, season, and so on. The Makahiki is a first fruits festival. Take that in, first fruits, fertility of the earth, uh, that ran roughly from October to February. As a first fruits festival, it celebrated the god of of the harvest, Lono, who is also god of rain and agriculture. Uh, through feasting, dancing, and sport, and also through ritual. A representation of Lono, the Akuloa, uh, which is already up there, was carried around the island clockwise. Uh, each community along the way paid tribute to this image in the form of pigs, taro, gourds, and other plants and mats, as Hawaiians sought in return fertility, peace, and prosper prosperity, which only Lono could bestow. And you know that the uh, season of Lono alternates with the season of Ku. Ku is the god of war. So peace to war, war to peace. Um, those are the oppositions that are in play here. At the close of the ceremonies, a canoe was loaded with these tributes and set adrift as a present to Lono. As with the Australian Aborigines and the Papua New Guinea Highlanders, a relationship was uh, forged between mythic figures and those upon whom they showered benefits on the condition of correct ritual performance. Uh, in all cases, land is understood as temporal and eventful. The locus of history, ironically I say that, and maintained through the relationship of reciprocity between living humans and those mythic beings who create and sustain them. Imagined in this way, land is fundamentally relational, a cosmic zone of give and take, and the morality uh, thereof. And I had actually opportunity to read uh, Hunters and Bureaucrats, um, and it seemed to me that much, with, much of what you say there resonates with uh, this here. Um, let's see, I dare say that I've got a, a bit of a coda here. Uh, I've become very interested in Vanuatu uh, because I have a student who is doing dissertation work on Vanuatu. He's very interested in land, contested landscape, and the alienation of land that has been taking place in Vanuatu over against customary, uh, residual customary tenure. Uh, he represents uh, customary tenure side of things. He actually married in. He has a son by uh, the Vanuatu uh, woman. So uh, I've gotten rather caught up in this whole thing. Uh, you might know that Vanuatu, um, as a, uh, Vanuatu is a new country, came into existence in 1980 uh, it, after a uh, long colonial period under uh, condominium uh, with 
Britain and France, they divided it up in some way. They couldn't decide, sort of like, um, who was it who wanted to cut the baby in the middle? <laughs> they didn't want to do that, so they decided to, or maybe they did do that, um, cut the baby in the middle. Uh, the, the part of the archipelago that he represents really is um, more British than French. There is some French uh, there, but uh, it's more, more, was more under British control than French control. Um, Vanuatu, Vanua is a Polynesian word. The New Zealand equivalent is Fenua, I believe. Tongi, Tonga Samo, you get Fanua. Um, it means land. So again, what does land mean? I have to go directly to that question again. I do not have the answers for Vanuatu. Uh, I'm coming new to this material, but some things do strike me uh, as interesting. Uh, some of the things that have not been emphasized in my talk is that land has always been important for identity purposes, ethnic identity purposes. I think this is one of the reasons Hawaiians adamant about getting their land. It's not just an economic resource, although it is that as well. It is theirs. It is their home within the cosmos. Um, and they want that back. <clears throat> Uh, in closing, I illustrate the importance of um, et to ethnic nationalism in the post-colonial era, supplementing materials from Hawaii, which I've already covered, with materials from Vanuatu, in, the ca in this case, the conceptualization of human land relations um, have been Christianized, and you see that in some of the uh, slides I'll show you. Uh, I got this um, information from an article by Margaret Jolly, which was actually published in 1992, uh, a while ago. Um, should have showed this slide. This is these are people recreating the makahiki on Kaholawe, and you can see that they're dressed in the red and gold garb of high chieftains, of high chiefs uh, from traditional Hawaii. Republic of Vanuatu. You can see where it is. Um, Vanua means land, home, state, origin. According to her gloss, again, what does land really mean? I'm not going to do any interpretive work there because the material is new to me. I don't have any kind of in-depth understanding. Uh, two is the one that really intrigues me. It means to exist, to stand, to aspire, to hope, uh, strength, and so on. Again, this is from the Jolly um, uh, article. I know in my Papua New Guinea vernacular, to stand is the masculine existential verb, so I bet Something like that is going on here. Um, put them together, Vanuatu means our land forever, ever, but I would also suggest, again, I haven't done any deep interpretive work here. I don't know why I'm suggesting anything. But it probably means something more like we, us forever. The country's name, flag, and coat of arms are meant as an expression and reassertion of who Ni Vanuatus have always been. Ni Vanuatu means indigenous peoples of Vanuatu uh, in the face of a period of colonial rupture. Uh, here's the flag. Um, the red means kinship, according to her interpretation. The black means their own skin color. The yellow means Christianity. Interesting. I did indicate that this is post-colonial symbolism. Um, and that has been inflected by Christian symbolism as well. I don't know what these um, icons over there uh, mean. The green means land. So here we are, Vanuatu. Uh, this is their coat of arms, long god you may stun, stun up. Um, people who know Melanesian, Melanesian pigeon, Bislama is essentially the same thing. We would say long god you may stun up. Um, I could stand corrected on that, but. <laughs> um, and there you get the you, me, which means we. We stand. We are uh, long God. So um, the way to interpret this, again, I'm not doing any uh, expert interpretation here. It's very amateurish, but this is uh, where I'm th my thinking is going. Um, that the land there is some kind of foundation. It's identified with a cosmic source of that foundation, which is God. Uh, and I would, again, translate this as we are, long God, uh, we are. Um, Tonga has a motto something like this, God and the land are our inheritance. Uh, according to her, uh, you have here a male ch chief. It's rooted, he is rooted in the soil, and then she translates it as when, uh, we stand up on God. Um, I have a line here I didn't read about male chauvinism. I dropped that out. But <laughs> um, typically his, typically he, um, the gender is 
ten, turns out to be male, except for the fact that uh, in terms of mythology, land is frequently feminized. Uh, this is definitely true in the Maori uh, materials. You have a female figure, Papa, who is the earth uh, figure. Um, there is a national anthem that she translates as meaning God gave, to the, gave the land to Nivi Vanuatu now, and thus conferred on them strength and freedom. Um, God gave the land to Nivanuatu. Again, we have this notion of prestation by a supernatural figure, or not a natural figure. Uh, in this case, God has been Christianized. Um, and then this becomes a foundation of, I would say, an order, uh, which is understood in cosmic terms. You know that Christianity is heaven, so that foundation will implicitly impose um, heaven. I believe this is all I have to say here. I don't think there's any more here. Oh, here we have one more. Um, this, is a, this, was, this is from a book that was written for the government on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of independence and quoted in her piece. Uh, and again, I think you can see uh, the carry over some of these themes that we've been talking about into a kind of Christian context, um, but the meaning probably being a continuum, continuation of perhaps what was there before. Our motto, Long God Ye Me Stan Up, reminds us to give back to God our Creator in sacrifice all that He has abundantly bestows, uh, bestowed upon us, prestation. We recognize God's mastery over our lives and proclaim that who we are and what we possess and all that is in our world belongs to God. All life, all business, all resources belong to God and we shall endeavor to practice good stewardship. So I'm suggesting that you know, in a post-colonial Christianized context you can find uh, similar things. This brings you into the era of contestation, of course, uh, which is something that my student will be looking at. That's what I have to say. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to engage in conversation.